We're going to bring the session to a start. I'm David Coolidge. I'm the director of musical theater at Ohio Northern University and the regional director for the Great Lakes region for just a couple more days. Yes. Um, I have the great privilege and honor of introducing Maggie T. Miller and Leo Chang uh, with their community agreements presentation. Uh, they both told me not to introduce them because uh, they're doing your shit. Right? Doing, yeah, they, got, they got a whole thing going, but instead uh, they wanted me to tee it up a little bit uh, of, in terms of how we are beginning to utilize some community agreements at Ohio Northern University with varying levels of uh, success and challenge. Um, and so I'm very, very excited uh, to learn from our colleagues uh, today. Um, I, I was struck again by looking at the community agreements in uh, MTA today, the talk around safer spaces and braver spaces, and that, that in, in the classroom, um, giving students agency to craft a set of, of uh, statements um, uh, for ourselves to agree, uh, agreements for our community, has, uh, has helped create safer and braver spaces. And, um, and, and yet, um, from an institutional standpoint, trying to figure out how uh, they're not just hollow words. And, um, and so I'm, I'm very, again, very excited uh, for this uh, opportunity to learn from two uh, remarkable colleagues. And I thank you both for bringing up a much needed conversation. Thanks, David. What are community agreements? What are they? Why are they important and where do they come from? Yes. That's what we will be talking about today. So, who are we? Ah, oh. So, this is my dear friend, Leo Chang. Uh, Leo uh, uses he, him pronouns. He is the vice president of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Currently, for three more days, yes. not that anyone's counting. <laughs> You've heard those three days a lot today. So you can <laughs> <laughs> it was first, but you will. Um, and he also currently teaches at Marymount Manhattan College. Um, something that I love about Leo is uh, his, his courage, how brave he is. He uh, has always struck me that way as something that I have... Uh, so it's funny that you told that story today oh. about Orlando when you, when you made that announcement <laughs> as a grad student because it was my introduction to you. And from that introduction, I've always been... It's, uh, I've always been so... Something I admire about you is, is that courage. And now that I know you as well as I do, and I consider you a, a friend, yes, I know that that doesn't necessarily come naturally, which mm. makes it even more <laughs> potent to say that you are a courageous human being because you're doing it from that perspective. So that's something that I love about my friend, uh, Leo. Thank you, thank yes. you so much, that's so sweet. And we have this gentleman over here. His name is Matthew Teague Miller. He goes by Maddie, he, him, pronouns. And he is the current MTA president out in three days. <laughs> and he teaches at Chico State University. And one thing that I love about Maddie is that he is really good at listening. And he makes space for others because he was the person who brought me onto this position. And at first I was like, no, Maddie, but I'm not going to answer your email, but he was, <laughs> this man doesn't give up. <laughs> so, and then he, like, we had multiple conversations before I agreed, and he was like, if you want to do this, we are doing this together, I'm not going to leave you alone, and he keeps his promise. So that's why we are here today talking about community agreement together. Uh, so what are they? What are community agreements? Um, well, community agreements establish a shared understanding of expectations in a classroom or a rehearsal space. Uh, they help to keep communication open, honest, respectful, and clear. And it's a mutual, this is a mutual agreement uh, between all parties in the room, student-student, teacher-student, student-teacher-assistant, student, uh, director-actor, all of the above. Everybody agrees to these community agreements. And this attempts to create an inclusive space for everyone to thrive. That's what we're talking about uh, when we're talking about community agreements. And ideally, these are like eight to 12 succinct, uh, uh, created collaboratively um, and uh, at the beginning of a course or a rehearsal uh, process. I uh, taught two classes this semester, and I directed a production. 
and uh, I have had I have community agreements for all three of them. There is not a space that I will enter where I am the leader that I won't make this part of the process, regardless of whether or not it's academic, professional, or otherwise. Um, funny enough, we're going to talk about three different ways that you can create community agreements. I used a different method with each of my classes and uh, my rehearsal process this year. Uh, and the three that we talked about are what I used. Yeah. So I'm kind of, you, you can ask me which I thought was the best if you want, but that's, that's you know, uh, a liberal. And we also came up with different ideas when we were just brainstorming, right? So Mary talked about what is the definition of community agreements. So the, the next one is what is their purpose, right? And the definition of community agreement sounds like, oh, something that we have learned about when we we're in elementary school, right? The classroom rules, but what is the differences? What are the purposes, right? And it leads me to two questions that I have for you. The first one is, why do you think we use agreements instead of norms or rules? Any thoughts? Rules lead to like a punitive type attitude. Mm -hmm. Posture is different if you cultivate agreement. Ah. Again, the word mutual. Yeah, exactly. Because agreement is agreed and created upon this group together, right? Whereas rules or norms is actually not created by you. Also, it's enforced by an authority. And that reintroduces re the power dynamics that we want to eradicate at the beginning, right? So, it leads to the second question, and I'm sure you have heard about this today a lot of times. Essentially, we are creating a space, and you probably know what my answer would be, but I have to say, what we are talking about and sharing today, it's not right or wrong. There's not a definite answer. We're here to share, and we also hope to hear from you as well. So, you see this blank. What do you think we can fill in for this blank? What is the space that we should create? safe we hear brave so yes there is a debate between safe and brave so safe yes that's the word that we started with right and it has helped us to get a long way however creating a safe space actually hinted that this is a space that you won't encounter risk you won't encounter discomfort but we all are musical theater performers and educators we know that is not true right we will run into it so we have to create a brave space together safe but brave so what is the definition of a brave space are we creating a space that encourages what can we have 20 seconds that we just throw out your answer what do you think a brave space requires or in vulnerability. vulnerability yes yep. risk, risk. Failure. Failure. failure courage, courage. Support. Support. Accountability? Yes. That's a Ooh, I love that. <laughs> That's a great segue into <laughs> the next. Well, yes, you pretty much said all the answers that I have. Vulnerability. Brene Brown says being vulnerable is being courageous, and being courageous is being vulnerable. Constructive feedback. We have to listen actively so that we can respond with care. Taking risks. Right? We have to create a brave space for that, leaning into discomfort and fears, because a lot of people say that I'm fearless, but we know that fear is always there. But we, Elizabeth Gilbert in Big Magic says, fear is always there. You have to let it in in your car, but just don't let fear drive your vehicle. Hey. Yes. Amen to her. <laughs> Self-reflection instead of assumption. I always start with this question with everyone in a group. Said, what is the thing that people cannot tell by looking at you? Right? And everyone get a chance to speak about that. And that actually depends the method that, oh, we have some assumptions on each other because we make assumptions on people every single day. Oh, accountability. We know about that and boundaries. Actually, we don't have a lot of times today because boundaries is something that we wanted to talk about as well. But setting up community agreements actually is helping us as educators as well to protect ourselves, to help us to set, set boundaries as well. All right, so Maddie, where did we first learn about them? You know, it's funny because you probably entered the space having heard the term community agreements. You probably 
uh, been in spaces that have utilized them. You know, I, I attended a workshop uh, just like, I don't remember if it was as the pandemic was unfolding or just before, and, and community agreements were entered to the, into the space. And I, full disclosure, kind of rolled my eyes at them. Um, I found them to be um, unnecessary. Boy, did I not recognize my privilege when I did that, by the way. Um, and, um, and so I, I kind of took it with a grain of salt. And then when uh, the MTEA executive committee went through our, uh, our training, our anti-racist training with Arts and Color, we went through the process of actually creating. So this was a different. The community agreements at the presentation were bestowed upon us, uh, but, which was very different than actually going through the process of creating them. Once I went through that process and once I had that training, I mean, that was life changing for me. And you're going to hear us talk about, the executive committee talk about those, that, that uh, training that we had a lot because it changed the organization as well. Um, but going through the process made me understand the importance. And like I said to you before, I am not going to be a leader in the space without these moving forward. Until, as my Angelo uh, said or in, in your slide earlier, until I learn something better. Uh, but for the time being, this is the best that I have, I have discovered. What about you? Yes, so when Maddie asked me about when did I learn about community agreement, my first thought was Chinese chess. So this is the board that, you know, for Chinese chess, and I used to play this growing up. So you can see this grid over here, the boxes over here, that's the place, it's the lines that you can walk. And in the middle, that says it's the river and it's the boundaries. So it actually sets the boundaries over here where you can walk, and that's part of the game, right? On the two sides, on, the, uh, on your left-hand side, it says if you are a, um, if you're watching the game, you should just keep your mouth <laughs> shut. And here it says if you're the player, you cannot regret every move that you make. So there's no turning back. So these are set over there for you to know, oh, that is our agreements before we start playing the game. And there are a lot of games that we played when we were young. Pretty much we have to set, set the agreements Absolutely. at the beginning, right? And, and games as kids, if you remember, were always more successful when we understood the expectations at the beginning right. as opposed to like <laughs> adding expectations move along. I'm trying to teach this to my four and a half year old as we speak. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, she's four now. Um, <laughs> All right, so why is it important to have them, Maddie? It's a great question, and, and what's funny is, uh, so at my university, we're the Department of Music and Theater, and the current chair of the department, who I adore, he's a good friend of mine, um, he's a music professor. They're at a very different stage in their conversations about inclusivity as, uh, the, as us on the theater side of things, and he occasionally will review notes from production meetings and saw the community agreements that we had made at the production meeting, and he said, he, he pulled me aside, he's like, uh, what are the, what are these about? I mean, it's, they, they all just basically say, don't be an asshole. Um, and that's true. But again, he doesn't recognize his privilege when he enters the space. As a tenured associate professor, white cis male, who, you know, in a very, uh, I mean, in an academic environment where he has a huge position of power. Um, so they, uh, why are they important to have them? Uh, what, what is the next? Let's see, what did I put next? Oh, well, first, first and foremost, it gives students a voice in their environment and in their experience. And I deeply believe that students who are paying for their education should have say in their yes. experience. It's Amen. their experience, not ours. Um, uh, it clearly lays out shared expectations, and as the analogy about the kids' games earlier, as you know, <laughs> we all thrive when we understand the mutual expectations that we have for one another. It gives everyone in the room tools to hold each other accountable for the tone of the room, um, and it can help balance the power and privilege dynamics. I, I, how many times have I said the word privilege you know, so far? I think four, uh, not that I'm counting. Um, it also empowers everyone in the community to set their boundaries. So. so here's the example that you have seen today, right? But we are not putting here saying that this is the rule that we have to abide by. No, we said that it's agreements, right? So we were just sharing that's what we have. And the conversation gets to how do we create them? Right. Where do they come from? Right. Um, and, and as I said in my two, ex my two early experiences with them, sh uh, creating these agreements together actually enhances their, uh, the buy-in from every single person in the room. So uh, one way 
Option number one, this is what I did in my literature musical theater class. I've got a student that was in the class right there. She's nodding along. Um, <laughs> but, um, you can create them from scratch, okay? When you create them from scratch, one, word, one way to do it is to start with like a big word cloud, kind of like what uh, Leo did when, when Leo was asking for what do we need in this space. You know, big word cloud, collective brainstorm, um, you know, uh, ask others to, you know, reinforce which of the words in the word cloud are, are the ones that we want to, uh, to, to use. You'll find if you go this way, you're going to get a lot of the same words or a lot of similar words. This becomes a little bit of a challenging part of the process because you'll want to collaborate and combine some of these words without, you know, uh, without shutting anybody down who brought an idea to the table. I find that a little bit challenging sometimes. We edit the overlap and then we organize. Oh, I didn't mean to. I, I see picture people. People. Taking notes in the 2023 way, taking photos of this, right? Um, so this was, if you're interested in this way, uh, our partners, Theatrical Intimacy Educators, do a whole workshop on it. And it is a very long process. Um, now, what are the pros of this process? Yes. Pros of this process are students have total ownership on the experience. Um, it's very organic, and I will tell you that it establishes a balanced and inclusive space for the whole class and rehearsal. Because from the very outset, not only do the agreements reinforce the space that you want to create, but the fact that people created them from scratch makes them feel like it's less of the I'm teaching down to you type of classroom that a lot of us have, and more of a we're in this learning experience together. Um, but a challenge, yeah. it's hella time consuming. It's very time consuming. I mean, you would want to devote a, your first week of classes to this, which is great if, that's, if, if you've got that time. Uh, very, very time consuming. And um, it can be challenging giving um, oversight on, well, this kind of is what I was saying a moment ago. When there's so many ideas in the room and you're trying to get it down to a succinct, succinct list, I find that uh, some of the uh, agreements end up being a little long-winded. It's trying to encapsulate three different students' ideas into one, or, uh, and that makes it a little bit uh, harder to have oversight of. Yes. So the next method is that something that I normally use in my classrooms is the meditation method. So at the beginning, I actually engage with the members, just like asking the questions, like I mentioned, what is the one thing that people would uh, don't know about you by looking at you or basically just like what did you eat this morning to give everyone a chance to just say something in the group and then i would ask everyone to walk around to familiarize themselves with the space it's just not like oh there's a window it's actually you can touch all the furniture and be in that space so that everyone feels like okay this is a space that i know and i can be comfortable doing things here then i can be brave then we start a meditation, a meditation. So I ask everyone to find a place that they feel comfortable. You can lay down, you can sit down, whatever. And we start with breathing, just like the meditation that Autumn you know, did with us um, at the beginning of your presentation. That was great. And then um, we start with breathing exercise and you just give them different prompts. And I ask them to think about what is the world? Well, would there any memory that make you feel like your voice or valued were heard or what is the world that you want to live in and i ask them to be very specific in the image that they see in their head to really picture that and i ask them to so when they are doing all the meditation i'll put the post-it around them and after the meditation i say Great, so we were just visiting in your brain what is the world that you want to live in and how can we create this community agreement together so that we can create this space among all of us. And after that, so one, every student would have two posted, at least they will write two things, and then we post them on the wall and then we share about them, we discuss them. Before we post them on the wall, actually, I ask everyone, so that person would say, oh, this is my agreement because da, 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 da. And I would ask everyone, is there anything you want to share, want to add? Do we all agree upon this? And if we have everyone agree upon that one, then we post it on the wall. So that's the, 
meditation method that I use. Pros and cons, it allows all members to participate. Everyone gets a voice, everyone gets to contribute. And it eliminates participants' expectation or assumption because I love doing those kind of things that I don't tell my students what I'm going to teach them today. We just do an activity, an exercise, and then boom, oh, that's what we're doing today. So without knowing that we are creating a community agreement, but actually we are going, that helps the students to really just speak what's in their heart. And creating an organic and calm vibe, that's for sure. We all love meditation, right? <laughs> but it can be very, very time consuming. Normally it takes from one to one and a half hour at least. And then it works better with a smaller group. So my class is normally 10 to 12 students, but I always do that at the beginning of the class because that really sets the tone for the following semester. Um, so then the third way that we're going to talk about today is what I've kind of coined the hybrid method. Um, in the hybrid approach, uh, the instructor or director starts the conversation with a handful of agreements. I arbitrarily said four to six because you don't want it to be, you don't want to dominate the space, but something to serve as the springboard in the space. Um, go ahead. Um, the leader offers these then for edits. So there is the students' voices are still being uh, uh, considered in this part of the equation. What this does for those people in your group, in your space that have never encountered a community agreement, it sort of introduces the spirit of the agreements. It also gives you a little bit of oversight as to what type of agreements maybe your, are precious to you. Take space and make space is gonna be in every single community agreement that I have an opportunity to help uh, because that's the one that I need the most. Um, and then uh, the group, after those handful are edit, we say, okay, well, what's missing? What's missing from these four to six agreements? Let's come up with some more. And then we basically, it's hybrid, because then we create them from scratch, similar to what we did with the two previous ways. Um, and then collaboratively, the agreements are placed in a new order so that we're not prioritizing any single student or, any, or the teacher uh, or director's uh, uh, point of view. Um, and so that uh, connects with the pr uh, priorities of the group. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so it's much quicker. It's still inclusive, not as inclusive, but it's much quicker um, and then created from scratch. It allows, again, I said this a moment ago, the leader to establish the tone and style and then the very concept of community agreements. The leader uh, gets to make this, make sure that things that are special to them or important to them or maybe important to the group of students that they are welcoming into their space because maybe they had a relationship with them, not I mean, a, a teaching relationship with them prior to that. Um, um, you know, maybe this group needs a little bit more, remember that we speak in draft kind of thing. Um, and, uh, but it is not as inclusive as creating it from scratch or the meditation method. Uh, and um, it does not create that round table experience that we were talking about in creating a space where all voices are equal, which is part of the goal of this method. It does seem to prioritize the teacher's voice first and foremost. So that is a challenge of it. But I will say that this is the approach that our, our anti-racist trainers did for the executive committee uh, board. It's also what I did in my uh, music theater styles class this year. I tried uh, his meditation method for uh, the rehearsal process of cabaret. And all three were uh, very effective. This was the one I'm probably gonna utilize the most because I only have 16 weeks in a semester mm -hmm. and I'm trying to juggle so much. So once the community agreements are created, are they done? What do we do after they are created? So the next steps, Mary, would you like to share with us what's the next step that we should do? Yeah, I think this is really important. I was just confirming that we started five minutes late and then there's a five minute break, I think. Is it right after this? He's laughing and he's like, you're the first. No, there's a 15 minute break after the next one. So we'll uh, Okay. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, it is not, that is not the power dynamic of this space. <laughs> <laughs> well, but we acknowledge that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like, this is a huge thing that I think is really, really important, is that one of the biggest missteps that leaders are new to create, uh, creating community agreements make is thinking that the work is done once the agreements have been made. They've made them, they forgot, I mean, they're, they're, they're posted, 
That's all you need to do. And that's simply not the case. When we do this, we not only undermine our leadership uh, for the course of the project, but we also undermine all of the future attempts by us and others to create that in, uh, uh, inclusive space through making community agreements. We also reestablish the innate power dynamic of the professional professor and student, thus defeating the purpose. People do this all the time. I have been in groups that make community agreements and never, ever talk about them again. So what do we do? What do you suggest? <laughs> <laughs> well, this I think is the most uh, important is, um, or not the most important, a very important thing to, to do. And this yeah. is the periodic check-in. Um, a great way to keep community agreements fresh is with the periodic check-in. Um, uh, what you do is you simply start class or rehearsal by listing the, putting them up on the board and taking a moment to have everybody in the class read them over again. Um, it's quite literally what Leo did uh, earlier. There are a today. lot of similarities. Yeah. yeah. Um, ask the class to read through them, refresh themselves. Um, uh, then ask for volunteers to share if there is one community agreement that is particularly resonating with them today. If they don't offer a why, inquire with the why so that it can actually start a conversation. Um, why is it causing to resonate? And do this with three or four student volunteers. You will be shocked how many students actually talk about things that resonate with them. Once this is part of your practice, people volunteer. Not, not, and that, not the same person every single time. If you enter the space and collectively breathe together, put those up on the board and ask, hey, what's popping for people today? They, they offer their point of view. And it's kind of thrilling because it's almost a way for them to re-endorse and, and also remind themselves. It's amazing. And that's when the conversation starts. And we have to hold each other accountable. But how do we do that, right? First of all, I think as educators, we have to be a role model. We have to hold ourselves accountable. If we don't share our vulnerability, it's impossible for our students to feel like, oh, you didn't share your life. Why should I do this? So sometimes I offer myself to, to do that at the beginning, and then I ask everyone to share, right? So. That's very important for us. And we also have to set a pulse button or any source of kind that you can say, oh, we have an agreement, our word is tofu, coke, whatever. We have that uh, mechanism. So when something harmful happens in the classroom, someone can just say, pause. And the only thing, and the first thing I would ask is, what can I do to help, right? So we can take a pulse. If we need to have some moment, then we take that moment, then we reconvene after a brief pause. And this is what we do. We have to encourage and facilitate the dialogues. We identify the cause, what just happened for both the people who caused harm or being harmed and reflect on it. And we have to acknowledge that good intentions do not equal to good impacts. Which is, by the way, a great uh, community agreement you may want to include in future community agreements. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and then because by doing so, we allow the chance to have that conversation so that we can repair. And after this conversation happens, we still need to check in with these people and with our communities to see where we are at right now. And I know it doesn't happen always in our classrooms, but a way that we can practice these kind of things is that we can bring in news or things that happens in our world or society and brings it to our classroom. Like, I don't think this aligns with our agreements. What do you think? And how can we change that? Well, what can you do if that is you? We can use those as a scenarios. So we, I don't think we have time, <laughs> but... It's because I talk so long about how much I love you and you talk Likewise. <laughs> That's the most important thing yeah, about this conversation. I presentation on that. <laughs> but there's one thing that we do really, like, because the three methods that we use, we do have some similarities. So we came up with this recap, three steps and three elements for community agreements. So the first one, three steps are during the process when we are creating community agreements. First is identify the community. Who are they? What is the size of a group? What is the method that we should use? Then engage with everyone, allow everyone to contribute to have a voice in this community. And then we create and discuss. It takes time, but we really need to make the space for community agreements to happen. And three elements, it's after the process. 
First is visibility. So we created the commuter agreements and we posted on a Google Doc so that it's circulating and then I make sure that is included in every email that I send out to my students in that class. Yeah. <laughs> and accountability. Because of that, we can continue to talk about accountability. If someone violates something or if something happens that does not, does not, I shouldn't say violet, does not align with our community agreements, then we can talk about that and have conversations. And at the end, it's adjustability. We have to make sure that this community agreement is an ongoing document that we can always, we have to always come back to say if there's anything that we don't align with anymore, is there anything that we need to change? And then as we exit, if you, you know, want to look over an example of community agreements, these are the community agreements that have been adopted by the Executive Committee of Musical Theater Educators Alliance. And Leo and I could talk about this for days, so pull mm -hmm. us aside on a lunch break or whatever, because... Um, we would learn, want to learn from y'all. That was a part of the, uh, yeah. the conversation we wanted to include, but we just ran out of time. We want to hear how you use them, uh, because I think growth mindset, the growth mindset in us is we've got to continue to evolve as we learn better methods. Absolutely. Um, but uh, this has been a treat. Likewise. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, friends.